You know, another funny thing about not being able to read Japanese is that I'm not sure who the, the villain is in this game, you know? There's that little ant guy who seems to control all the robots, but I'm not actually sure if that's not a, a bunch of guys. It could be Dark Dirge from the first tempo, but I never really got far in that one, and I'm not sure about, you know, I didn't have a manual, I, like this one I only have the ROM, so I don't know who Dark Dirge is or what he looks like. Uh, but I gotta say, our villain here does have like impeccable taste in decor. Uh, I go to a space fortress, you know, nine out of ten times. I expect to see cold, metallic, bland walls, you know, windows into the nebula, lasers, robots, stormtroopers, whatever. But here it's, it's kind of a nice stucco, almost like a Spanish colonial style house. It's got warm, neutral colors, a nice playful tree print on the wall, you know. I feel welcomed here. I feel at home. This place is like, you know, I can just hang out with the guys, kick back, have some barbecue. And I mean, honestly, if you really look at it, this place essentially seems to be like a space hotel, which is cool because it's like Star Trek The Next Generation, which is, you know, it's a classy show. Except the, the aliens here are a little bit cooler and you have to use doorknobs. Little known fact, in the Star Trek TNG episode, uh, Code of Honor, there's a breakdancing contest in which the, the leader of this pseudo-African alien tribe refuses to join the Federation unless Tasha Yar best him in a dance-off. You know, no holes barred, Bolian rules, and ironically enough, they dance to the very music that you're hearing right now, which is a bad thing, because this is a terrible song. It's gotta be one of the most uh, Atari 2600-ass repetitive video game musics ever. I mean, it's like I stumbled into the options menu of a Hong Kong bootleg of Aladdin. And you know, in a game that's ostensibly all about the music, there's no excuse for that, you know? And it's, it's, I'm thinking to myself, maybe the villain is playing this over the loudspeakers on purpose, you know, it's like a, a party where the host is playing a song he knows is a signal to clear everybody out, or, you know, some kind of deadly sonic weaponry developed by Al-Qaeda, you know, not to sound racist, but th this sounds Middle Eastern. And you know, I'm Dark Dirge, Osama, hum, are they brothers? You know, not to mention that in America, a huge number of hotels are run by people who are, you know, a little suspiciously brown, you know? I guess when it boils down to it, what I'm trying to say is that Ramada Inn, despite their delicious complimentary breakfast featuring Minute Maid products and, you know, Pinnacle Award winning best of class amenities, they're probably a sleeper cell for Saddam and Osama's secret elite VR troopers who have been trained in hotel motel management to make Americans as comfortable as possible so that one day when our most precious resource, white women, are on the road on a fancy business trip sitting back on their bed, uh, enjoying the free cable, sipping on an apple teeny, watching a Sex in the City marathon on TBS, the Superstation, when wham, the wall turns around Scooby-Doo style, and there's a squad of armed gunmen who force her to dress in one of those sexy, like, belly dancing get-ups so they can sell her into white slavery to, like, a super rich chic so they can have more money to buy even more weapons of mass destruction. <clears throat> And guess what, when that, that aging but still hittable business lady cries out for help, who's going to be there to save her? Uh, Jack Bauer, terrorist killer extraordinaire? Of course not, he's a fictional character. No, it'll be Tempo the Grasshopper. Except he won't have to save her because he already made a preemptive strike at the hotel, like I'm doing right now in this very game as we speak. He's making our country safer from Kim Jong-il's private Beetleborg Defense Force, day by day, sacrificing the time he could be spending in, in his clown house, with his woman, grilling up the best steaks west of the Mississippi that taste so good like it would be like an insult to even put sauce on the things and he invites all the dudes from his men's study group at church over and they watch the big game and kinda awkwardly condemn all the sexuality and debauchery in the beer commercials but then later that night Katie gives him a head or eats his head, I'm not sure how anthropomorphic bugs really work but no, none of that happens because Tempo's out in the field fighting these people of terrorist descent so that you and I can live our lives watching the big NASCAR race 500 or going to see uh, Larry the Redneck free of fear that one day some unstable San freaking American unleashes a dirty bomb at the New Orleans levees reflooding the city and killing actor singer Harry Connick Jr. who was all set to star in Independence Day 2 reprising his role as Captain Jimmy Wilder but this time he's a ghost who only Will Smith can see but not an ordinary Will Smith, he got elected president because him and Goldblum blew up the moon base with the Macintosh so President Will Smith's in the White House, right? and he's like this hardcore Republican and then a uh, young Democratic senator played by Nate Cannon tries to sell him on a new environmental initiative 
and then Will Smith says, uh, no, you did not just pitch that green shit at me. <laughs> talking about oh yeah interior decorating but I mean I, okay, I gotta be strict with you a couple of floors up is the kind of technodrome you place that an Utram warlord from Dimension X would build but I, I just mean that it's nice to walk into the front door and have it be a nice joint you know I mean even Katie and Tempo are only in this to decorate their house with the stuff they find they're, they're not bugs of honor they have the same needs that you and I have for instance you know who doesn't want to encase people in bubbles you know Maybe you're alone in the park, and uh, a kind of cute, athletic uh, redhead walks by and flashes you a smile. You know, she's got this um, self-confidence, a little bit of an air of warmth about her, and the, the cutest little freckles. And let's say you happen to be uh, a ruggedly handsome scientist who has invented some kind of uh, super unpoppable soap bubbles. And she accidentally steps into one, you know, and she's kind of trapped in there, you know. I mean, she can she can breathe, of course. There's enough oxygen to last a while, and then she lets out a, a silent scream from inside the glistening orb. So vulnerable, helpless. And the the only way you can save her is take her back to your lab, you know. So you kind of gingerly place your hands on the edge of the bubble. And you carry her back to the, the trunk of your van 